Okay, so we've got a couple of people this week in our in our good lessons from bad guys book. And uh, today we're going to be looking at Hophni and Phineas. Sounds like a cartoon, if you ask me. Isn't there a Phineas cartoon? Phineas and Ferb. And who? Ferb. Ferb? Mm -hmm. yes. Phineas and Ferb. Oh, my kids were into it. Mm -hmm. I knew there was something like that. Yeah. I, I remember Ren and Stimpy, but I don't remember Phineas and Ferb. I, yeah, I always tried to watch it. Really I should? Okay. I'm going to have to watch it. You know, I always had to watch cartoons with the kids. You got to make sure you know what they're watching, right? <laughs> yeah, we made that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it was animated, it was a cartoon, and we found out very quickly when DJ was little bit. <laughs> the Simpsons was not, it was an adult cartoon. <laughs> All right, so this this story today is going to come to us from uh, from First Samuel, and so remember the story of, of Samuel. You know his mom um, is Hannah, his dad is Elkanah, and Hannah has wanted a child, you know, her whole life. She begs God for a son, and says, you know, if you give me a son, you know, as soon as he's weaned, I'll, I'll I'll give him to the priesthood. He'll serve you, and so God grants her request and gives her Samuel, and so Samuel, <clears throat> once he's old enough, he goes off to be with Eli, and Eli, the priest, is going to train him in the ways, you know, of the priesthood, and uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting story, and, and I guess Eli does a really good job with Samuel, but he struggles with his own kids, because that's who Hophni and Phinehas are, they're, they're Eli's sons, and they're rascals, <laughs> they're, they're beyond rascals. They're they they really they're really some hardcore probably almost criminals really. Well, the author tells this story. He likes to really he wants to relate this story to why is it that we come to church? Why do we come to worship? What is it that drives us? What's our motivation to bring us here when the doors are open and when we gather as a congregation? And Phineas and Hopney really kind of took advantage of their position. They were leaders, um, and uh, they didn't have great motivation. So the author starts off with this story, and I thought this would be a good way to open the class. It reads like this. When my wife and I were quite a bit younger, we worked with the local um, youth at our congregation. We hosted devotions, we took them on camping trips, and organized various fellowship activities. During this time, a kind-hearted teenage boy started coming to our church, and began attending the youth activities. He had a quiet demeanor and sweet personality. I typically don't refer to other males as sweet, but no other word properly describes this young man's spirit. His smile put a smile on my face. I loved joking around with him just to see that radiant, infectious smile. Since he was a high school senior, when he joined our youth group, it was not long before he started attending a local community college. He stopped participating in the youth program at the time, but still came regularly to most of the other activities at our church. My relationship with this friendly young man continued to grow, and I felt like I needed to help bring him to a saving faith in Jesus. So when the moment seemed right, I asked if I could study the Bible with him. With no hesitancy, he responded, yes. He laid it over his acceptance. We immediately set up a convenient time for him to come over to our house. With his exposure to many sermons, classes, and devotionals at our church over a couple of years, I made some assumptions concerning his spiritual leanings and chose some key passages to kick off our study. When we met for the first time, we read the passages together, and I asked him a question or two. Sometimes I wanted him to comment on the meaning of what he had read, and I also attempted to bring about a little introspection. His responses to some of my questions left me a bit perplexed. I remember asking myself, did I make a mistake in my assessment of his spirituality? I stopped and looked him in the eyes and asked, do you believe in God? And to my amazement, he said, no, I'm an atheist. Shocked and bewildered, I immediately responded, why have you been coming all this time? He flashed one of those warm-hearted smiles at me and said, I like the people. People of this moral caliber and ethics are who I want to hang around. Motivations vary as to why some individuals attend church and serve in various capacities. Obviously, I possess no powers to look into human hearts to determine their motivations, though some have shared them with me both directly and indirectly. Such insights have not only been surprising at times, but also quite revealing 
as to the source of some behaviors. What drives our attendance and our service may often be spiritually healthy, but there are times it can be unhealthy. A biblical example may help spur our thinking <clears throat> on this subject. So that seems pretty odd to me that this kid could uh, could con somebody, somebody who worked with the youth, spent considerable amount of time, and after a year, the adults did not realize that this kid was an atheist. Do you think that would have come up in conversation at some point? Somebody might have looked that up. <clears throat> Interesting story, though. So let's go to uh, 1 Samuel. We're going to be in chapter 2. And um, so we're going to start in verse 12. So this is after uh, Samuel has been dropped off with Eli. And Hannah is so thankful. She has this... Uh, uh, this beautiful prayer, and, and that she gives this uh, almost like a song, a poem to God. And so after that, um, the story goes into a little bit about Eli and his son. So starting in verse 12. Oh, yeah. And good morning to those online. I know the Bell and the Smiths are online. I'm sorry I didn't say a good morning to you earlier. Glad you guys are here this morning. And the Jacksons, man. Oh, and the Jacksons. Good morning. Glad the Jacksons are here, too. <clears throat> Okay, starting in verse 12, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests with the people that whenever anyone offered a sacrifice and while the meat was being boiled, the servant of the priest would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would plunge it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot and the priest would take for himself whatever the fork brought up. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the servants of the priest would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat to, the ro to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the man said to him, let the fat be burned up first and then take whatever you want, the servant would then answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Okay, we'll stop there for a moment. Remember how we're going to talk about um, what we're reading here today. We want to tell the story, we want to relate to the story, and we want to talk about how we live the story. So in telling the story... Samuel, the author of Samuel, seems to be pretty deliberate in what he's saying. He wants there to be no uh, confusion about Eli's sons, because he opens it up with, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. <coughs> they're in the priesthood. They're in the tribe of Levi. They're serving in this role, and they are wicked men. What does it say about them? What exactly did they do here? What have we, what have we seen so far? It's kind of it's kind of hard to follow this this deal with the meat, right? Because I read this and I thought, oh, okay, I guess they're they're a little demanding about the meat that they're supposed to get. If you go back to Leviticus chapter seven, we don't have to go back and read that. But if you go back to chapter seven, um, the God uh, God is giving Moses, you know, the direction on how these sacrifices are supposed to be conducted. And what portions are to be given um, to the priests and, and what are to be used for the sacrifices and such. And it's actually laid out. God lays it out exactly who's supposed to get what. You're supposed to use the breast meat from the lamb uh, for the wave sacrifice. And, um, and you're supposed to make sure that the fat gets burned up. Um, you're supposed to give like the right thigh to, 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 to one priest and the left thigh to another. I mean, there's specific rules on how you divvy up the meat. These guys sent their servants out, and they said, no, this is how we're going to do it. They're going to show up with this big old fork, and they're going to just start sticking it in the pot, and whatever they can get stuck on their fork, that's what they're going to take, which is, you know, kind of a corrupt way to handle that. And in fact, they even say, you know what? We would actually prefer that the meat's not even boiled. We'd like it raw, because I'm guessing, you know, they got a smoker back at the house. <laughs> And they're wanting to do it up, you know, their own way. They're not wanting this boiled meat. I'm not a real big fan of boiled meat myself. <clears throat> if I had a choice to cook it over fire or roast it in an oven, that's what I prefer to do. But these guys were dictating 
how they wanted to get their meat. They were gluttonous and they wanted choice cuts and they wanted it in the form and fashion that they wanted to get it and they didn't care what the rules were. Did they not care what the rules were or did they not care who the ruler was? I think it's a combination of both. <clears throat> Verse 12 says, they had no regard for the Lord. That's a powerful statement, is it not? It's interesting that the author doesn't even mention their names. He just calls them Eli's sons. It's almost like the author is kind of, um, he's sickened by, by who they are. I know in some versions, I think it's the King James Version, they describe them as Belial's sons. Now, Belial is not a name. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I guess it's a, an adjective, and it, it's really defined as worthless, corrupt, evil, it can be described as scoundrels. They did not know the Lord. In verse 12, you read that they had no regard for the Lord. What chapter? I'm sorry. Uh, second second uh, chapter of 1 Samuel. Let's read a little further so we get a bigger picture of, of what these guys were like. We're going to drop down to verse 22. <clears throat> now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. If a man sins against another man, God may mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. So we learn a little bit more. Not only, not only are they greedy with the meat, but you have these women who come to the temple to offer service to God, and these guys force them into having sex. These guys are some real characters. What do you think motivated that? The devil. Pardon? The devil. The devil, yeah. They were certainly prone to falling to temptation. Seems like they had a you know, a spirit of rebellion. It's almost like they wanted to flaunt this. I mean, they weren't trying to hide it. In fact, the author goes into a little bit of a discussion. Um, let me see, where is that? Um, in verse 17, it reads, this sin of the young man was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Um, the author goes into some different translations of verse 17. And he actually says, this contempt for the Lord, this contempt for offerings, wasn't just from Eli's sons. The people who were bringing the offerings, the people who were coming to sacrifice, didn't want to do it. They had contempt for the very sacrifice itself because of what they had to go through. They knew what they were going to face when they gathered together. When they came uh, to the temple to present their sacrifice, they knew it was not going to be handled in the way that they knew uh, Scripture told them to. They knew that their meat was going to be confiscated, that the fat offerings weren't going to be done properly, the wave offerings weren't going to, do, weren't going to be done well, and they were going to be facing pressure and threats from the people who were, who were there. It made it uncomfortable for them to come. Can you imagine having people who attend your worship and they create such a stress that others in the congregation don't want to come. Certainly don't want to interact with them. Maybe they want to sit on the other side of the auditorium and avoid those people. Can you imagine that situation?
What do you think about Eli's confrontation? I think it was the right thing he did. Think so? Mm-hmm. I mean, if my children were doing something <clears throat> that brought disrespect on me and I name, and, and even God, he was, I, mean, I think most people would call him out, or he should mm-hmm. call him out. Yeah, I definitely think he had a responsibility to do that. <clears throat> that when, I got. I don't understand. I mean, if they're so <clears throat> bad, like, like, how do they get in that position in the first place? But how do they get to, to that position? They're their dad. He likes the priest. Yeah, okay. they're in the line of Aaron. They're Levites, and uh, and this is this is to be their job. Okay. I think it's interesting that when Eli does finally rebuke his son, when he finally confronts him on this, we read um, his sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. What does that sound like? We're not heading down the right path. <laughs> Let's go to Romans chapter one and read something we read a few months ago when we were studying Romans. And when we were studying Paul, I think we read it too. Chapter one, starting in verse 24. <clears throat> Therefore, God gave them over in, sinful desi- in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity <clears throat> for degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over shameful love. Kind of seems like maybe Eli waited a little long to do this confrontation. It wasn't until he's getting, apparently he's getting replies from the public, from the people. They're complaining. He's hearing what's going on, and he calls him out on it. But at this point, it's gone on so long that God already has willed for them to die. I'm guessing Eli has waited a little bit too long to interact, to fulfill his responsibility as a father. In verse 25 of Romans that we just read, it says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. It almost seems like to me that Eli maybe has put his son, the importance of his son's lives and their position above God. <clears throat> so maybe it was that he didn't want to risk that relationship with him. <clears throat> You know, because I feel like that happens a lot now. Like as parents, you know, even I sometimes do. It's like oh, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that, or I don't want them to be upset. But like, we um, have yeah, some family that they never got their, they never made their children do anything, and now their children, their children are adults, and like they don't listen to them, and they're disrespectful. And now it's at the point where if I say something, they'll just never talk to me. You know, and it's like. Instead of doing what he had to do for God, and they have been like, well, we'll be okay. Maybe they'll figure it out, you know? Yeah. A lot of times it doesn't happen. So it may not be that he was putting on the bus, but he was like, I just can't work that relationship. It's hard. It is hard. It's hard to be yeah. tough with our kids. It's even think? harder to be tough on your grandkids. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's harder when they're older. I mean, because we obviously have small kids. Let's really you know, can't do that. But like, whenever you have a child with an adult and you have to like get on to them for like doing something, it's harder. Yeah, mm-hmm. even adult mm-hmm. children are so much harder than young children. You can't really play with friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I try. 
I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> we know, Miss Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was <laughs> yeah, I mean, you certainly know how tough it can be raising kids, and um, but I think those priorities of you know what's important here. <clears throat> do I risk the relationship with my kids? Do I risk that they can handle it? Do I risk that God can help heal this relationship? If I do bruise it, if I do injure it. Well, and I think you have to look at the big picture too. I mean, you know, you might you might ruin the relationship here on earth, but what you're trying to do is you, you want them to go to heaven. You know? And so well, and I know and I know that that would be very hard. I mean, I I very much you know, I've got children that, you know, obey and that kind of stuff, but um
will come and bow down before him for a piece of silver and a crust of bread and plead. Appoint me to some of the priests to some priestly office so I can have food to eat. <clears throat> Interesting. Who is this man of God that came to Eli? It just says a man of God. He's some sort of prophet. He's speaking for God. We don't know who it is. There's no name given. There's some guesses, but um, there's nothing to really tell you who this is. But a prophet comes to Eli and tells him, this is what the Lord said. <clears throat> and he reminds him of his people in Egypt. And he reminds him of Aaron, who he chose, and that tribe. He reminds him of of the law and the tradition and what they were to do and what their responsibilities were. And then he he lets them know, I, I know what you've been doing. You honor your son more than you honor me by fattening yourselves in the choice parts of every offering made by my people. They're literally stealing the sacrifices of the Israelites. They're stealing it for themselves. What I find interesting, you know, you always think God's in control and he's got this set path. Well, it sounds like here, you know, God had a plan and humans changed it. And so now it's going to go a different way than what he originally had planned. It's going to be different participants. Yeah. His plan is still going to be accomplished. His plan will always be accomplished. But yeah. the great thing is, is he asks us to be a part of that. And we get to choose. We're not forced. But we get to participate if we want to. So Hockney and Phineas were doing all the wrong things for all the wrong reasons. What about the different scenarios there? When do we do right things, but for the wrong reasons. What's an example of that? The one that came to my mind was, you know, attending, getting my name checked off on the roll. I come because God said we're supposed to come, and that's good. But if that's why I'm coming, if that's the only reason I'm here, if I'm not here to worship and to serve, and to edify and encourage others, if that's not why I'm here, I'm not here to learn and to grow and know God more and take my opportunity to serve. If I'm just here, check off an attendance roster. I'm doing the right thing, but I'm doing it for the wrong reason. <clears throat> Anything else come to mind? When you help someone so that you look good. Oh. That's a good one. Yeah. Especially if it's one of those more public things, right? Get you out front. Get a lot of kudos, a lot of pats on the back. It's still a good thing. People are still blessed. But you kind of got your reward, didn't you? I was thinking helping somebody, but actually enabling them to do that thing. Ah. Helping them cover up or hmm. sometimes you can help too much. Yeah. Especially if we wanna if we wanna keep people from suffering negative consequences, right? That's hard. It's hard to watch people suffer the results of their behavior. Maybe that's what got Eli in this boat. He saw his kids were were gonna be difficult when they were young and maybe he didn't want to see them suffer. I have seen that. <laughs> Families who raise their kids with little to no discipline. Out of a strong desire to want to love and to show love, maybe they thought their lives were hard and they wanted their kids' lives to be easier. And it seemed like the right thing to do until they until they matured and they became adults. And then their mistakes that they were making were had a lot bigger ramifications. And they had a lot more suffering as a result of that. That's really easy to fall into. Yeah. Because you want your kids a better life than what you have. 
whole chapter of First Corinthians 13. It's just because it is, but I don't know. But it is, but I don't know. Yeah. 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 I always comes back to that heart thing, your motivation. Why are you doing this? I'm doing it to look good in front of Rick, or am I doing it? Because Doug actually needs help and I want to help Doug. So we can have we can have good motivation, right? But do the wrong things. <clears throat> we want to do the right thing, but we want to help somebody, we want to do something good, but we in, invariably choose the wrong thing to do, even though our, maybe our heart is in the right place. We want to help, we want to alleviate pain and suffering. But we don't want to take somebody off of God's plan for them, whatever his will is. Is it possible that there are aspects of church life, of our spiritual lives, that can be <clears throat> That can become unhealthy if they're the primary reason for why we're why we're coming. I can tell you, I'm very tempted to worship this. I love research, I love reading, I like going back and finding the meaning words, I love delving into that. And I, I could easily become somebody who is who says, Hold on, oh yeah, it says here you gotta do this, and if you're not, you're sinning. And let me keep track of that for you. <laughs> yep. Let me know if you see that happening, okay? Because it's it's easy for me to fall into that pattern. I want to have a heart for God's word, and I want it to permeate every part of my being, but man, I can make this my focus. I can make service my focus. Dale could make preaching his focus. Um, leaders can make leading their, their idol, right? We have to remember, like Rita reminded us, we can do all these things, but it's, it's got to have, it's got to be part of the love of Christ. Or it's probably it's going to be harmful, harmful for us and harmful for those we come in contact with. Answer this question: What comes first? Does an experience with God lead to proper motivations for serving Him, or do proper motivations lead to experiencing God? Kind of like the chicken or the egg. Yeah. I think it could be. Let's look and see how this story ended. <clears throat> Okay, so at this point, um, <clears throat> Eli's being called. He's going to be the one that, that God is talking about that, the, the, that he said was going to, he was going to appoint to lead. And Samuel was going to become probably the greatest prophet, the greatest uh, high priest uh, that Israel had ever seen or would ever see. Um, and uh, there comes a point where uh, the Israelites are going to attack the Philistines. And these two knucklehead brothers decide they're going to take the they're going to take the ark out with them when they go. And so here's what happens in that battle: the Philistines learn that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. The Philistines were afraid. The God has come into the camp. They said, "We're in trouble. Nothing like this has ever happened before." Woe to us! Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews, as they have been subject to you. 
be men and fight. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas died. That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh, his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived there, when he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching, because his heart feared for the ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, what is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened to my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died, for he was old. He was an old man and heavy. He had led Israel 40 years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. <clears throat> when she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pain. As she was dying, the women attending her said, don't despair, you've given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay attention. That's a horrible ending to this family. Wow. <clears throat> There's a little note there that I, I don't think I would have noticed it except that the author pointed it out, so this is not my insight. But how did it say Eli died? Broke his neck. He broke his neck. Because he was an old man and was heavy. Yeah. <laughs> remember the remember the the, the old the, the, the man of God, the prophet that came to him and told him, you know, you've been gluttonous, you've been stealing from the people of Israel, you've been saving the choice cuts of meat, the fattiest parts of the meat for yourself. Now we see the result of this. He's ninety eight years old and he's a big old boy. And he's shocked to hear. I mean, it sounds like he's shocked that his son's died, but it's more so that the ark of God had been stolen by the Philistines. And he falls off his chair, and because he's heavy, and because he's 98, he breaks his neck, and he's dead. That's not a, that's not a great way to go. Well, you know, it doesn't really sound like he was the saint either, and that kind of way, why are you confused by your, why your son's right like this? I mean, yeah. you, you know, I mean, they kind of fall on your lead. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. And yet Eli is responsible for teaching Samuel God's way, God's laws. How about that? Makes you think that there's a little something different between knowing the law and living the law, right? Or having the law, understanding the law, but not having love. Not caring about what God cares about. It's not enough to know how to perform sacrifices, to perform rituals, to perform traditions. It's not enough. It's not enough to have good motivation. And there too, I know that I expect different things from my kids than I do from your kids. You know, whoever you may be. Yeah. You know, so. And maybe because of the home that um, Samuel was born into, maybe he had a greater respect for adults, and especially for somebody like Eli. And his mom and dad would come to visit him, and they would bring him clothing and things like that. So there's a relationship there. And if you haven't been to the, to the early service, uh, Dale's lesson on respect really relates to this. I think it's, a, it's, I mean, there's all kinds of lessons here, and there's all kinds of things we can draw from this. But just a great reminder that we don't want to get caught up in, especially, it's so easy. Is it not so easy to get in ruts right now? 
I mean, it's, with with the pandemic, the confusion over the election, just the stuff that's going on, uh, being kind of stuck at home, and um, it's easy to get caught up in ruts and, and routine and kind of forget why we do things and why we need to be here. And I think it's so important for us to be together. And you have to know there's a group of us leaders who are fighting to keep our doors open. Thank fighting you. to keep class going for those who, who can come, who don't feel so compromised that can't come, because it's important for us to be together. It's great that we have the electronic version, and I'm so happy for that, because without it, you know, we, we would have nothing other than what we would just do in our own homes. But we would lose that connection, we would lose that relationship. And so I'm really glad for that. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the great comments. Appreciate it. Really needed your help this morning. <laughs> this was a, a struggle for me. So I um, appreciate everybody contributing. And uh, it's a great, great discussion. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for being online. Appreciate y'all being a part of this.